I want to do an article about you and your life at Quabbin and how things have changed since you started working there in the 80s. And he made me feel real old. And uh, so this was, when the article came out, this was the headline. And I saw that and I said to him, I said, hey, Brad, I said, what's this free range photographer, you know? He says, well, it's not my fault. It, it was the editor of the club. And so I figured if I was a free range photographer, I might as well just come clean. I have no antibiotics, no added vitamins, no growth hormones. And people say to me, you must have spent hours and hours and hours to get these pictures. And um, that's the answer right there. Um, I will go in, I'll find a place where I've been seeing things. I have a couple of beaver ponds. I hung some pictures of beavers up, uh, out there this afternoon. And Margaret was standing and she said, oh, this is going to be real popular. <laughs> so, because of the beaver controversy down here. But anyways, this, um, this was a sunrise and I just put it with this saying and that's 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 my key uh, early spring quabbin this right here is the Munson Turnpike Road right here um, it goes from South Quabbin and it goes all the way up into uh, Athol and, and if you've ever hiked at Quabbin that's the soapstone and there's a really nice view from from the soapstone so we're going to start in the spring with with the beaver ponds um, since they've done away with the trapping 10 or 15 years ago, beaver population has exploded and, and so have the otters. And I get to the point where there was a couple of beaver ponds that I would go into in the morning and um, in the spring and the beavers finally, they just, they got used to seeing me there. So I could stand right on the end of the dam with my telephoto lens and they would go, they would go back and forth and back and forth and I was able to get this stuff like this picture here. Uh, the beavers weigh between 35 and 50 pounds. It's the second largest rodent in the world. The capybara in South America is the largest one. They range from two to three feet in length and their tail is 10 to 18 inches long. Uh, they have sh long shiny guard hairs. The fur is dark brown, reddish to color, and they can stay in the water for 15 minutes. The young ones are born in early spring and they don't come out into the ponds. You, you won't see them until mid, mid to late summer. Um, when, when the beavers are two years old, they just kind of leave and a colony can have uh, the, adult, the adult beavers mate for life. They stay together for life. And they can have the young of the year and then the beavers from last year. So you could, you could have a colony with as many as seven or eight beavers in it. And they have these glands uh, between their legs and they secrete um, like an oil called castorum. And they wash, if you've ever seen a beaver, and watch them, they look like they're washing their their ears and their head and everything and that's they take the castorum on their feet and they smear it all over them to help them stay waterproof. They have uh, flaps in their ears and their nose so the water won't get into their head cavity when they go underwater and they've got um, um, lenses like Yeah, like uh, contact lenses. And their teeth are sharp as heck. They have to chew to keep the teeth down. If something happens to them and they can't chew, their teeth just keep on growing. And eventually they'll starve to death because, because they, can't, they can't eat. And um, this right here is action. This is something new I've added to my programs. This is 
This is a beaver plugging up a hole. They've, they've got the strongest teeth of any animal I've ever seen. The stuff that they carry. <laughs> That's a beautiful. <coughs> that's a photo. I've got a copy of that out on thing there. And it's just this is one of the beavers that would come right up in front of me. I was standing under an oak tree and I was kind of behind it. And he came right up on the end of the dam and he was searching for acorns. I had never seen beavers go after acorns. But they were really chewing away at the acorns and this guy stopped and I took a video of him doing this. This was five or, five, five or six minute event. And he had that stick and he sounded just like a, like a pencil, pencil sharpener. I could hear him chewing and chewing and chewing on it. Where's Waldo? <laughs> they are really funny animals. Like he, was, uh, he was chewing on the backside of this, the bar. And I happened to be across the pond with my lens. And I, I looked, looked through the lens and I saw that and I snapped the picture and I really didn't pay any attention until I got it home. I thought it was pretty funny. In the spring, when you start seeing this, you, you're going to start seeing otters. Otters come up on the ice to eat their fish. Um, they weigh between 11 and 30 pounds. Uh, they have 375,000 hairs per square inch. Uh, it keeps them warm. That's why they can crawl around on the ice. And the beavers have 175,000 hairs per square inch. And I have no idea how they figured that out. <laughs> and I always, I always can picture in my mind a wildlife biology student going in, a freshman going in for a biology class, and the professor says, here's your class project. <laughs> I count these hairs. <laughs> It's a pair of them that were rolling around on the ice. And uh, so there was something up in the woods. I don't know. They're very curious. But they're pretty skittish, too. And there was something in the woods that they were looking at. And I could not see what it was. And it even made this guy stop eating his fish. But they're, they're so active. And um, they're, they're, they're so high strung. they do. They play, they slide on their belly, they jump on each other. They just keep going and going and going. To the tide? Yeah. yeah. I don't even know if they slow down. But every time I see an otter, right, it's, it's a good day. This is one of the many ponds that flow into the Quabbin. The Quabbin is a Nipmuc Indian word. Quabbin is a Nipmuc Indian word that means land of many waters. There's over 100 brooks and streams that flow into the Quabbin. And one day I saw this coyote and he had something that he was playing with. He was like a cat playing with a um, uh, cat and mouse. And he, he had this meadow bowl of something he was playing with. And he was throwing it up in the air and he was stomping on it. Yeah, and I, I, I watched him for about 10 minutes and then finally he, he knew I was there and finally he said I'm taking my breakfast and going home <laughs> and he didn't even offer me any. Uh, bald eagles at Quabbin, they've been there since the 80s. I was lucky enough to work on the reintroduction program. They let, 80, uh, they let 42 bald eagles go, 41 bald eagles go in the Quabbin in uh, the 80s. And the reason they did it like that was because bald eagles imprint uh, on an area they grow up in like a salmon. So eagles hadn't been nesting in Massachusetts since 1906. So Jack Swedberg from the Division of Fish and Wildlife wanted to reintroduce them into Massachusetts. So they brought eagles from, the first two were from Michigan, 
And then the rest of them came from Nova Scotia up on Cape Breton Island. And um, they, they raised them until they could fly. They let them go. And that was the 42 birds were the birds that started the nesting eagles in Massachusetts. And last, this past June, at the nesting, the yearly nesting uh, survey, they came up with 57 pairs of eagles nesting in Massachusetts. And here's a pair. Um, this was on the Connecticut River. This was in Barton's Cove in Greenfield. And I happened to be in there one day, and it was windy as heck. And I see these two eagles soaring around. <clears throat> so I get out of the car, almost blew away. But I, I watched, and these birds came in. And they landed about 100 yards um, out on the ice. The the males are always smaller than birds of prey. Um, so this would be the male and that would be the female. And I, I wondered what in the heck kind of a conversation was going on. <laughs> and then I saw what, what they were talking about and I couldn't show that up here today because it would be X-rated. Boy, <laughs> And the ducks, the ducks, there's all kinds of ducks in the spring if you're a bird watcher. Those are, those are ring-necked ducks. These are common regansers. And, and the males are just beautiful little ducks. <coughs> These are, <coughs> I'm sorry, those were hooded regansers. These are common regansers. They're cousins of the hooded regansers. The hooded regansers um, nest here in, in, in beaver ponds. And these guys nest here, but they nest in big lakes along the shore. <clears throat> and I was wondering what these guys were talking about. I thought maybe it was who was going to win the series. <laughs> and then when I saw Mrs. Common Reganser, I knew what they were arguing about. <laughs> and I got this just as she came out of the beauty parlor. <laughs> she had her hair done and her lipstick put on. Ospreys, they're fish eaters, mainly they, that's all they eat is fish. And they come through in the spring in the quabbin. They have tried to get them to nest at the quabbin, but for some reason they will not nest. They put what they call nesting platforms up to try and entice the osprey to nest, but they don't. They, um, and, and they were doing this even before. Somebody said to me, well, it's because of all the bald eagles, but they were trying to get them to nest in here even before the eagles came in, and they don't. And uh, they, they really, I've seen the osprey really catch some huge fish. You can see this guy's got about an 18 inch pickerel down in his talons there. <clears throat> this is a harrier. They used to call them marsh hawks, and they migrate through here in the spring. They like big um, open fields. And on the end of Mount El and Coavin, there's a huge uh, flat place, and it's loaded with Phragmites, and it's perfect for um, one of these guys to hunt. And the brown ones are females. This is a female. And the males are gray, and they call the males, they call them the gray ghost. And you very see, you very seldom see the gray ones. Like this. This is a barred owl. This is the most common owl in Massachusetts, and it's got a call that goes like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Uh, here's a pair of great horned owls. Uh, these are chicks. There's a third one in there, but he's up out of sight of the, can the, the view. And they nested in a great blue heron nest. You know, why build a nest when you can steal them? Geese. I love geese. Right now the geese are all heading south in the spring. They all head north. Geese battles. This guy um, and his mate, he's got a, a leg band. So I can tell him there are three beaver lodges in this pond. In the last three years, him and his mate have nested on each one of the beaver lodges. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything scientific about that, but 
this one here. Oh yeah, that's just a, a nice spring day, beautiful uh, warblers singing. This field right here has a lot of bobolinks in it. Turkeys were um, completely wiped out in the 1700s, late 1700s in, in Massachusetts. In 1911, Mass Wildlife started to reintroduce turkeys and between then and the late 60s, they did it nine or 10 times and only once did it very, very take it took, but it didn't last very long. So they got some birds from Northern New York. They were hardier and they let two or three flocks go. They left out the Berkshires and then they let some of them go in New Salem. And um, I live in New Salem and now everywhere you look you see turkeys. So, and they're, they're all over the state. And this guy was glaring at me because I was taking his picture crawling up out of the pond. <laughs> this is a painted turtle. Turtles that are found at Quabbin, the painted, northern painted turtles, um, snapping turtles, um, box turtles, musk turtles. Did I say snapping turtles? I think I did, yeah. Um, and I couldn't help but take this picture of a muskrat eating an acorn. He popped right up in front of me. So they um, they look like mini beavers, although they're not. You can see they've got the, the rat ears and they've got a long, you can't see it, but they've got the long rat tail. They make a nest that looks like a beaver lodge, only it's made out of grass and phragmites and stuff. And these guys, I love these guys. They start showing up in the ponds in May and June. This, I think I took this picture in early, early July. Uh, a uh, full-grown bull moose needs to eat 50 pounds a day of grasses and weeds and bark and stuff just to um, keep a healthy diet going. And go the other way, there's a lot of, lot of birds in the Quabbin. If you like birding, that's the place to go. This is a, a black and white warbler, and they go up and down the trees, and they got a call that sounds like a squeaky door. This is a common yellow throat that's a warbler. Uh, I call them the long range of birds. And this is a yellow warbler. And these, when you hear these guys singing, they sound like they're saying, sweet, sweet, sweet. And they high pitch. This is a chestnut sided warbler, as you can probably figure out from the picture. And these guys have a call that goes, very, very, very pleased to meet you. <laughs> Catbirds, these are what they call mimics. They're relatives of the mockingbirds and the brown thrashes. And these cats go, uh, these birds sing constantly. Um, different, they learn parts of different bird songs and they repeat them. And we have three indoor cats, and we have a cat bird that nests in the facility bush in the front of the house. And it keeps us, keeps our cats entertained all, all spring, summer, and fall. There are still cat birds around. I saw a couple this morning in a beaver pond that I was in. Gray squirrel in the spring. Um, he was running up a wall, carrying moss for his young ones. They, they'll nest in cavities, um, woodpecker cavities, brown, brown cavities, any, any hole that they can hide up in. And this is a baby chipmunk. And I watched this baby chipmunk for quite a while. As you can see, he has a certain place that he would like to chew on his acorns. And I was... I, I call these kind of pictures collateral damage because I was waiting for the beavers mm -hmm. and there was a there was an old wall on the side and this chipmunk kept running back and forth so to keep myself from getting bored I start taking pictures and this is one of the pictures that I took. Friends of mine called me up and said, hey Dale, can you come down here and bring your trail camera and we've got some sort of animals living in the back. So I said, I'll be down this afternoon, and she called me up, and she said, don't bother coming, bringing your camera. She said, um, they're fox, we've got a family of fox. 
and she said, we're going to Maine, we're leaving tomorrow, we're going to be gone for two weeks with a camper, so why don't you come on down and see if you can take some pictures. So I was expecting a red fox, and I hadn't been there two minutes, and this gray fox, this female gray fox popped up, and she came running over the top, and she had uh, three kits. She stopped right at the... Um, door of the den and she looked at me and I looked at her and <laughs> I thought oh, she's going to take off and she didn't. She went right down into the den and then a little while later all three of the young ones came out. And, uh, they were on this huge pile of rock and I, you know kids have had this game called whack-a-mole, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well this is what I felt like only with it with a camera because these these three little guys kept coming up every other it would come up over here and then they'd come up over there and then one would be up here and two would be over here and I was going like this with a camera. No idea what they were watching, but they they spent ten or fifteen minutes watching something on the ground there. They were really funny. And as I was saying, there's a snapping turtle. Um, in the spring you probably have all seen turtles in the road. Um, what they're doing, those are female turtles, and they're going to lay their eggs. <coughs> Historically, they go to the same place every year. And they'll dig a hole with their air, legs like this, and they'll lay the eggs, they'll cover them up, and then they'll leave. And then within 12, 24 hours, a skunk and a possum, a coyote, um, a raccoon will come by and they'll smell the eggs and they'll dig the holes up and they'll have themselves a meal. <coughs> Doesn't always work that way, but 90% of the time. This is a pileated woodpecker. And uh, these are the largest woodpeckers we have here. And this is a female. Uh, males, this is a male, a young male. He's got the red on the sides of their, their bill. And the females do not have the red there. And uh, I found this hole, and I watched it for quite a while. And I, my wife and I um, go up to Cape Breton quite often. <coughs> we, we had to leave in June for our vacation up there. And when we came back, the, the birds had already gone. So I didn't see the young ones fledge. But there was a, also there was a female in there. So there were two chicks in that hole. There they are. See the male? And there's the female. <coughs> and if you ever have a camera and you want to have something have be tested, try and take a picture of a wood duck. <laughs> try and get up, sneak up on a wood duck. Um, this, this wood duck landed just to the left of me, 35 feet, and I had the lens out to the pond, and I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, so I just just started moving the lens around, and she sat right there, and she started preening, and I took three or four pitches, and then she just hopped down into the water, and away she went. And almost the same thing happened to me in a different pond. A couple days later, the oh, wow. adult wood duck. Mm -hmm. I was sitting, and this adult wood duck came along eating the bulbs, so the lilies, and uh, he was pecking on them. I don't know if he was, he was trying to figure out whether he was going for insects in there or what, what he was chasing, but he, he hopped up right in front of me, and uh, he shook all the water off him, and he looked around a little bit, had no idea I was there, and uh, he hopped back into the water, and off he went. Uh, it's a wood duck family. In this particular pond, there were three wood duck families this year. There was this one, I think there's seven chicks there. One female had five chicks and another female had 12. And there are still some chicks around. Um, they're pretty much full grown. Some of the later ones still you can tell they're chicks. And most of them have left but there are still a few in the pond. I was in this particular pond this morning. And this is uh, Mrs. Carmen McGanzer. See, she's still got her lipstick. <laughs> uh, her hair looks like it's, she's 
been through the ringer, but <laughs> um, she's got these young chicks and we were doing a loon survey. I, I do weekly loon surveys with the, the people in the DCR and I've been doing it forever. And we were in the boat one day and I saw her and it was just, I'd never seen baby mergansis that, that small. Uh, they blend right in. When they get a little bit, little bit larger, they go out. And organsas do the same thing as loons. They'll ride up on the back. And uh, calmer organsas have this trait where, well, like any ducks, the, the, the adults do not feed ducks. The ducks, when ducks are hatched, they're on their own right off the bat. The only thing they do is just swim behind mom. But the mergansers, they will, if there's a couple of mergansers with seven or eight chicks, they'll get together. And one of the females might think, well, hey, I've had enough babysitting. I want to have some fun. And she'll take off. And she'll leave the chicks with mom. So the next thing you know, mom is going around like this. <laughs> with a chick on the back, no less. But you can see this, see the different size of them? There's this, this probably two or three families of common organsas there. That's surprisingly unreg unregulated at the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's, so that's, right. that's right, that's right. And here's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Goose with this year's batch from the Beaver Lodge. And they only stay around every year. They'll stay around for <coughs> two or three weeks, and then they'll disappear. I have no idea where these geese take them young ones. Um, there's, a, there's a brook that flows out of that, and it goes into a larger pond. But that's a mile and a half away. I mean, maybe, they, maybe they take them down the pond. But uh, it's, they do, they've got the same routine every year. <laughs> Getting into the summer, the beavers, again, they have these lodges, they spend the summer in the, the lodges, they, they pack mud all over it so it stays cool. And once in a while, you, in the morning, you can catch them out. They, they love um, lily, lily weeds, the um, pond lilies. You can see where they've all been, all been nipped off. <laughs> and they just... It's really funny because they just they get so into eating them things. Yeah, it, it looks almost like leather. If you've never seen a beaver's tail, there's a good there's a good picture. And this particular pond is a large beaver. I don't know if it's a male or female, but it has a great big notch out of its tail up on the end there. So I, I can tell that it's that it's that particular beaver. But yeah, I mean they they treat these things so gentle. Know. And here's one that was up in the middle of the morning eating some grass. I don't know if it had a problem, if it had some cow in it or what, but uh, occasionally I do see them. They'll, they'll haul up in the middle of the day. and not It's not usual, but I see beavers out until 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning sometimes. It depends on how hot it is and how much work they have to do. And what time do they get back out at night? Um, right at dusk. Right at dusk, yep. Yeah. And they slap their tails in the water um, as a form of warning to one of the other beavers around that there might be danger around. And um, beavers underwater and above water can hear them. It's a form of communications. And I, I, I love taking pictures of beavers doing that because I just put down the shutter and it just, and I never know what I'm going to get. And I got home this particular day and I had this guy who just put the tail up and he was just ready to let it rip back down. But they have a tremendous splash. If you've ever heard it, it sounds like somebody take, takes a big boulder and throws it push down to the water. And I love great moon herons. I've spent probably more time waiting for herons <coughs> to, to even move than 
you know, um, they weigh between five and six pounds. You would think a big bird like that would weigh pretty heavy. Its wingspan is seven feet, but they don't. And they're the heaviest heron in North America. Um, and if you've ever tried to sneak up on them, you can't do it because they have what's called monocular vision. One eye looks this way and the other eye looks that way. And they can they can swivel it around. It's almost like a like a tank, I would imagine. Um, they're they're pretty um, pretty skittish. I, I that's one thing I like about having a long lens. Although there was there was a bird a couple weeks couple winters uh, summers ago that kind of got got used to me. Uh, they're colonial nesters. By that I mean they live in colonies, but not always. This this pair had um, these three chicks. This particular um, nest was about 60 feet up in the middle of a small beaver pond, and they nested there two or three years in a row. And the nasty winter we had last winter, um, I mean the nasty weather, it, it blew this nest down and. They didn't, they didn't rebuild. This is this, the same pair. <coughs> and I'm really surprised that uh, adult herons don't lose their eyesight. When, when they come in, uh, <coughs> they, they regurgitate fish up. And the three young herons, their beaks are so sharp. And they're all reaching up and they're grabbing for the beak. And it happens so fast. <laughs> and the older the herons get, the longer between feedings. So sometimes I'll go in and I'll stay four hours and I'll only see two feedings. And I'll take only but maybe two, or th they'll be there for two or three minutes. And then the adults will take off. <laughs> but you never know, you get some spectacular, <coughs> spectacular pitches of the herons coming in for a landing. And when the young ones leave the nest, the adults do not feed them if they're not in the nest. And the only way these birds can get fed is to figure out how to fly back up into the nest. And they usually do. I've never seen them do it, but I've seen a nest that had three chicks in it, and then I've gone back the next day. There's been one then I go back the next day and there's all three back there. And they do that until they can fly, usually a week and a half, two weeks from the first one leaving. They're, they're gone and then they have no more ties to the parents and they just go and you know wander the countryside. And this is the one I was talking about. This, um, this guy right here, uh, I called him Guark. <laughs> because that's the, the noise they make. You can tell when they're coming because they go rock. <laughs> but I found a place in the woods right up um, by this stump. And I watched it and I watched it and I thought to myself, man, it would be great if one of these great little herons, <coughs> there were two or three of them in the pond, would come in and land on that stump and boy, did I get my wish. I saw him come in one morning and he spread his wings out and um, he fell in love with that stump and, and I fell in love with him because he, every morning he would come in and he would fish from that stump and he would look in the stump and he would look around the stump and sometimes he'd fish behind the stump, sometimes he'd catch little fish Sometimes he'd catch big fish, and sometimes he'd catch salad with his fish. <laughs> but between the otters and all the herons that were in that pond, I'm surprised that there are any fish left in that pond. And this is the rare stone heron. <laughs> it, it, it takes a long time to take off. It flies like a rock. Yeah, yeah, and you don't want to be underneath it when it comes in for a landing. And if you've never seen a, a blue heron catch a fish, I sometimes I wait for hours to see this. And last week, this young heron landed in front of me. 
and I was watching him, and I turned the camera on, and I said, hey, go. That's actual speed. That's actual speed. That's actual speed. You look at the phone. See, he got salad with his fish, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love that. In fact, I love it so much. Let's watch it again. See how slow they move? It's just like, I don't know how this bird can move so slow. But they're so alert when they're in the pond. They whip that head around. It, it, it's just amazing. But patience. That's what you need, patience. You need patience if you're a heron, too. Peter. I do. Snuck up on you. Whoops. Okay. And this green heron was not cleared by the FAA to take off. <laughs> and you can see the great blue heron, the look on his face is like, hey, I'm eating, I'm eating here. I'm fishing here, I'm fishing here. Green herons are smaller. Um, they go like grease lightning. They dive into the water head first. And they get into the into the water any any way they can. This guy whoosh, launched right down into the water head first. And this guy here again, the stump. They come and they fish from the stump. And this guy decided he was going to wave his fish around, saying, "Hey, I caught one." And there's an otter appeared, and the heron immediately flew away with his fish. <laughs> this is a green heron. This is up, up back on the board. Um, I'm amazed at the, what these birds can do with their bill. They zip the little, if you ever look at a bird's feather, it's like a zipper. And, and they, they take, even the big herons, the great blue herons, they drive me crazy because they'll be fishing and they'll be fishing and then all of a sudden it's time to preen. And 10, 15, 20 minutes later, it's, it's like, oh, uh, yeah, I was fishing. So they'll go back. But, I mean, look at, look at on the end of that wing, that bird. It's just an amazing bird. And the, uh, the amazing part to me is he's doing it on one, all that on one leg. <laughs> and this is an adult green heron that decided to land where two kingbirds were building their nest. And they don't call them kingbirds for nothing. <laughs> that that heron lasted about 90 seconds on that branch before off he went. Uh, one of the bald eagles is a chick right there. Um, the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife, they go into the Quabbin and they try and ban every bald eagle that um, is, is hatched. They, when they have a guy that climbs trees with ropes, and what they do is he'll go up, they'll find the nest, they know in Quabbin, they know where every nest is, and they watch the nest. And when the chicks are about six weeks old, they'll send this guy up the tree, he'll take the chicks and he'll put them in a bag, a cloth bag, and he'll lower it down. And the biologist down below will take the bird out, they'll weigh the bird, They'll inspect it to make sure it's perfectly healthy. They'll put leg bands on the bird, and they'll put vitamins. Um, I don't know if they still do that, but they used to. They'll put vitamin pills in them, and then they'll send them back up. And the adult birds just kind of soar around and watch, and the minute, the minute they leave, the adult birds come right back in. And you can see the bands on this bird. This bird right here is only 14 weeks old, but I wouldn't want to have it land on my head. 
and it was thinking about laying it on my head too by the looks of it. And this is a that old bald eagle, it takes them five years for the head and tail to turn white. And they've got this beautiful, these beautiful feathers. And I took this picture, this is also out there. Um, this is a picture I took up on Cape Breton Island. And the reason I put this in here, because Cape Breton Island is where they brought uh, most of the chicks down to let go at Quabbin. And uh, eagles up there are everywhere. And I was walking down the, the beach one day, and this, yeah, I spotted this eagle sitting, sitting up on the ledge, and he was sitting in a tree. And there was some sea ducks out bobbing up and down in the waves, and I thought for sure he was going to go. And uh, I waited about five or six minutes, and sure enough, he jumped out and he went, he went out and he just flew over the ducks. And all the ducks went under the water, and he laughed and he flew off. <laughs> loons. Uh, I love loons. I'm lucky enough to work on the loon pro program at Quabbin. Um, the males weigh between 13 and 50 pounds. You can't tell them that they, they, they both look the same. You can't tell them apart. Wingspan is four feet. The body's 32 inches long. Um, they have web feet that are way back. They don't nest. They don't walk like a duck. Um, they nest along the shore. Um, it takes uh, juveniles two years to grow and develop the nice loon plumage. And loons don't migrate to South America like hawks. They just go off the Cape or down off Rhode Island to Connecticut. And they stay, the chicks will stay right up until the reservoir freezes over. And, but the males will leave um, in the end of November. In first of December, they'll, they'll leave for the, leave, they'll leave for the coast. And this is what I mean by the birds with the legs up in the back. Um, these two birds, I took this, this past spring, I was um, up in the woods waiting for coyotes to come trotting along and these two territorial birds showed up. And this bird, we call this bird whitey. You can you can just make it out right there. He's got a white streak of fur down the back of his head. And this is him and his mate and we figured they were you know, I figured they were just looking for, for a place to build a nest because um, this is what they do. This is how they nest. And if the water comes up, it'll flood out the nest. If the water goes way down, then the birds can't get to the nest. They, they push themselves along on their belly. And this is a bird in the, in the summer. This is how they regulate their body, their body heat. They got that beautiful red eye. And so in the late 1980s, Mass Wildlife decided that they would build these rafts. Loon, balloons are very territorial. Um, they come back to the same territories every year. They don't necessarily nest in the same spot every year. And it was, it was believed that they made it for life. And in the mid-1980s, there was a guy named David Evers. Um, he was a graduate student at the University of Maine, and he developed a method with which to catch loons and to put colored leg bands on them. And it was cutting edge on loon research, and since then they have learned so much different biology about the loons. Um, they have a database on all the loons they know, where they were banded, when they were banded. And they don't, they don't ban them when they're chicks, they, they ban the adult birds. Um, this is a bird on these nests. So they made these nests. Um, they are about eight feet square, and they put sod on them. They put what they call a predator guard to keep an eagle off this bird. And the nests were anchored with long cable. Uh, and it, there was a, a lot of it. So if the water came up, the raft would come up. If the water went down, the raft would go down. Um, last summer, just before these birds nested on this raft, uh, we were told that one side of it was dipping into the water. 
So we got some styrofoam type material and we were going to put it underneath the corner. So we, we came up to this nest. There were no birds nesting on it. So we put the front of the boat right on it and I was hanging on to one corner. I had one corner in one hand and the other corner on the boat I was holding it, holding us together <coughs> so we wouldn't drift away. And my colleague, his name is Lee Attix, he, he wrote the um, he wrote the forward in my book. He's a loon biologist, and he, he was trying to stuff that stuff. He his, both of his arms right down to water, and he was trying to put that stuff up. And this bird, one of these birds, hopped right up on the nest, and it was like a foot, a foot and a half from us. And I don't know who was mo more surprised, us or the bird. Um, but the bird didn't stay long. The bird hopped right off the raft. But that was kind of a kind of a surprise. But sometimes these birds use these rafts, and sometimes they don't. And here's a raft, a beautiful, brand new raft. Um, we couldn't figure out why this bird would nest on this little small island. So I took it upon myself to look into this, and I figured, well, wh why aren't the loons nesting? Uh, maybe I should test them out myself. <laughs> Personally, I couldn't see anything wrong with them. I don't know what the loons see wrong with them, but... And here's a, an adult loon with a, with a baby chick. They, they ride on the backs for a couple, couple weeks. Uh, this bird was probably uh, a day or two old. And riding up front with Dad. This this picture is also out there. And um, a couple day old loon getting chick. They, the birds hatch out of the egg, and within four or five hours they're in the water. And they only go back to the nest while the other bird is still there. It it takes a, a loon egg 28 days to hatch, and they don't both hatch together. So if one if one bird hatched on a Monday, then it would go right in the water, but it would keep going back and forth. And if the other egg hatched the next day, when that chick went in the water, that was it. They're, they're done with the nest for the year. And they spend the rest of the year with um, mom and dad. And here's Whitey um, with his two chicks. Unfortunately, one of those chicks disappeared when they were six weeks old, and um, we think it was a bald eagle. Uh, bald eagles get quite a few loon chicks, and they, they get adult loons, too. And there's, there's Whitey with his two chicks, this, um, two, two weeks, I think they were three weeks old when we took this picture, picture and that that's, is Whitey, and he's got a crayfish. And they feed them, and they feed them, and they feed them, and loons feed them, and loons are the best parents. Uh, I saw an adult loon feeding a young one the other day, and the young one's almost as big as the, as the adults now. But here's a pair of those colored bands. Um, when they catch the loons, they put the bands on them. They take blood samples. They're creating a DNA database and um, they test the blood they do different they like um, it's lead there's a couple other tests that they use and they take they snip off uh, some of the feathers the last couple inches of the feathers and they use that to test for mercury and the, the bands really show up so you can see see that I could take a picture of that and look in the database and I could tell you where this where this bird was banded, and where it's been found, and where it's been seen, and, and they eat sunfish. They try to eat sunfish. Mm -hmm. um, this bird worked and worked and worked on that sunfish before it finally got it down. Yeah. Um, I just, I just love these birds, and sometimes the sun is just right. And it don't, don't get any better than that. And there's a pair of, well, yeah, it's twice as big. 
And with all of the photography, pictures of the, the sun, the eclipse of the sun, I was out one day doing a loan survey and I saw this and that rock was half covering up that bird. So I decided I would take a picture a partial, so that's a partial eclipse of the loon. <laughs> Early morning, that's a mile from my house. Is the Corbin Reservoir down there. Fabulous sunrises up there. It's a good place to go early in the morning and get eaten alive by mosquitoes. <laughs> in certain, certain times of the year. Uh, coyote puppies, I ran into four of them. And this is one of them. That's the litter mate. They were really funny, chasing each other around. I wish I'd had a, a video camera with me. <coughs> and then just as quickly as they appeared, they disappeared into the woods. Another bull moose, eating his 50 pounds worth. You never know when otters are gonna pop up. Um, this, this guy popped up and he looked at me and I took his picture and then he just kind of disappeared. <laughs> but they'll fish, they'll stay underneath the lily pads and all you can see is just a ripple in the water where they're going. Very seldom when it's that covered do you see, see, see them. Um, you're more apt to see the full bodies in the winter when there's ice and when out, there's not all the lily pads and everything. And I was taking a picture of this great blue heron one day and this otter popped up in front of me. So I took a picture of the otter and the otter looked back and forth and then the, uh, the otter went under. So I followed it with my camera and about, it went to the right about 100 yards and it came up in some grass and it had the whole family with it. So there's, they, they have three to five kids every year. There's three of them, either mom or dad, I'm not quite sure. And this is this year in the same pond, and this is one of the adults with three of the young ones. It's a female deer. With it getting the red color, this particular pond, there are deer come out early in the morning, and they start around June and beginning of June and they go until the middle of July. A friend of mine who's a hunter saw this picture and he says, hey, where'd you take that? <laughs> I told him, Secret Lake. <laughs> this is the back cover on my book. And I saw this doe one day a couple of years ago and she kept coming out she kept looking up in the woods and looking up in the woods and a couple of days later the same thing went on and I just happened to see that she had a fawn with her and that's why she was no, so nervous the first day I was there and this is a green heron and this is a kingfisher and they're waiting in line for the beauty pilot to open so they have their hair done <laughs> This is another collateral damage picture while waiting for beavers. Um, there was a jewelweed in front of me and there's uh, a couple of female hummingbirds that come in every, every summer. And the trick is trying to catch them when they sit. Usually it's like that. Once in a while they'll sit and clean. And these guys sit all the time. But try and see these guys. I was lucky to see this guy up on the up on the log because usually they sit down in there and they hunk it down, and all you can see is just just the eyes. This is a bullfrog. He he was pretty good size. And this is the most common dragonfly in North America. This is called a blue dasher. Early in the morning, he was backlit from the sun. And it, it brought out the, the wings and the cobwebs. Uh, bumblebee and mullen, there were four or five bees on this mullen. 
and I, I took this with a 400 millimeter telephoto lens and I stood back about 50 feet and I was quite surprised at the detail of that. I cropped it up a little and there it is. You can see the pollen sacs are full. And um, there was a friend of mine is into bees and he told me the name of this bumblebee, but I cannot remember it. It was some sort of a Latin name. And he said you can tell by the length of the, the mouth part. Yeah. Uh, this is sunrise. People say to me, did you Photoshop that? <laughs> well, I don't own Photoshop. <laughs> and no, I didn't. You have to be there to, to, to believe it, to see it. And this, this, is, this was used in an advertisement. If you ever land at Logan Airport and you come out of Terminal B, right beside Starbucks, you'll see this. It's eight feet high and 10 feet long. And it's an advertisement for North Quabbin. Chamber of Commerce. Wow. Visit North Quam. Remember the young Bragancers that were riding on Mom's back? Well, they turned into punks. <laughs> <laughs> they terrorizing minnows. And I was lucky enough to be there on the first day of the synchronized dancing. <laughs> <laughs> First place went to the Greater Yellow Legs. <laughs> you see a lot of these birds right now during migration and they run up and down the shore and they also like to chase all the minnows. What are they called? Greater Yellow Legs. They're a sandpiper. But they lost points. They still won. They lost points because this has the left leg up and this one has the right leg up. So. Autumn, this is what it's starting to look like out there now. This is the um, this is the west, the east branch of Fever Brook. And I love these guys. There's another moose. You see a young, young stud. He walked out in the woods and took a look at me and just kept right on going. And I don't know who was more surprised, her or I. She still was eating her breakfast. You can see the early morning sun coming down through. And see, she wasn't happy with me because the hair is right up on the back of her neck. So I just kind of stood there and she stood there and finally she left. Off she went, she went down the road and she went over the wall up into the woods. And I was sitting uh, in the woods by this big field and I heard what I thought was the Boston Marathon come in and it happened to be this bull moose and he ran right out into the middle of the field and he stopped. And he took a couple looks around, a couple sniffs and off he went. And about 45 minutes later, I found him with, a, with another, another moose. And I, I don't know what they were talking about. It could have been hockey. I don't, I don't know. And this is a moose that, that the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife called. They called him the Prescott Bull because he spent uh, most of his life on Prescott Peninsula. In the Quabbin, he had a radio collar on him in 2006 and 2007, and it was a satellite collar, and they learned an awful lot about moose movement in Massachusetts and where they went. And the data that they got through that could tell when it was walking, when it was laying down, where it had been. Uh, it's amazing how much they get out of that stuff. And I have taken pictures of this guy three years in a row. I ran into him, and he's, he's 13, 12 or 13 years old. This was the last picture I took, and the biologist, um, Dave Waddles from the state, looked at this, and he said he thought he looked a little bit thin. So he said he might be having some digestion problems. But there was this one particular area that I was going in, and I was, I was seeing moose quite often. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I stopped seeing them. It was just like somebody 
sucked them up with a moose vacuum cleaner and I couldn't figure it out. So one day I just got back to my car and I saw this sign that was posted on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> that answered it. So I got in the car, off I went. Even the deer were laughing at me. <laughs> Who left that sign there? <laughs> what was the sign? The deer wrote that. The moose wrote that. <laughs> You, you don't believe me? <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll I'll disclose why that sign is up here. My wife, she always comes home from work and she says, "Did you take any pictures today?" And when I was taking these moves, you know. I didn't have any, any moose, so I knew that she was going to ask me if I'd seen any moose. So I made this sign, and I taped it on the tree, and I took a picture of it, and I sent it to her at work. <laughs> okay, back to the beavers this time of year. I saw this coming across the pond and I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought it was some kind of a monster. And then I saw the eyes and the little ears and the nose. This was about 15 feet long. And he went right by me and I watched him pull that thing right up on top of the lodge. Similar to this is the eye. See, see, see his face right there? This heading right for the dam. They really work in the fall. Yes. I've been pulling a dam down a day. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you do that with your teeth? <laughs> nope. And they pack up the lodge for the winter because it's going to be a long, cold winter. And while all that's going on, they have a big, they build up a big brush pile they call a cache. And when everything freezes over, they don't hibernate. They can go out of the pond and they can go underneath and chew off what they need and take it back up into the pond. And um, this, this particular beaver colony, they were waiting for the TV guy to come and stand up their TV mast. <laughs> That's more island than Quabbin. That's looking south from the mount. Remember I, I showed you Prescott? I mean, uh, Pop Brook earlier, where I said the salmon were going up into the woods. This is this is the mouth of that brook, looking south. And this right here is um, Mount Russ, and this is where the first bald eagle nest was back in 1989, 88, I guess, from the birds that they let go. And. These crows, there's a whole flock of crows in this one particular place I go, in the Quabbin, I'm on the shore of Quabbin now, and these guys ask for it. Um, it's a Cooper's hawk, and he was chasing the crows around, and the crows were dishing it right out, they were chasing him back. <laughs> so finally, he left. A couple days later, I'm in there, and here they are, chasing a broadwing hawk, chewing off broadwing hawk around. And um, he finally, they, they drove him nuts, so, so he left. Oops. And he decided he was going to preen. So I took some pictures of him while he was preening, and he's got his eye closed. One thing I've noticed about birds, I see them preen a lot, they, they always close their eye for protection so they don't get injured with their eyes, especially hawks, because that's, that's how they get there. Their feet. This is a peregrine falcon with chasing the crows around in the same location. Um, it's a young one, its crop is full, it's already eaten, and um, they're the fastest birds um, in the face of the earth. This is a bird that was released in um, Springfield last spring, 
There's a Koopa's hawk. I was sitting in the woods and there were chipmunks playing around and this Koopa's hawk came by and decided it was going to go after a chipmunk and it didn't see me but I was able to get some pretty good pictures of it. It's a red, red shouldered hawk. Um, winter. Yeah. Nope. No fake. Last day of 2015. Just some winter pictures. You can see a, there's a beaver lodge there. And the ice, when the ice starts getting over is when I get excited because I get to see things run across the ice. There's a pair of fox, and the eagles sitting up in the tree. There's a pair of coyotes that I would see go by every now and then. And there's the male, decided he was going to come down in the water and get a drink. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is bobcats. Uh, all of a sudden, this winter, I ran into a slew of bobcats. Um, they weigh, adults weigh about 22 pounds. Females are a little less. Um, they're not mountain lions. They don't look anything like mountain lions. Some of them can have territories as big as 42 um, square miles. This is the bobcat on the cover of my book. He, he went that way, and he went into the bushes, and then he came back to have another look at me. And that's the original photograph of the cat. And after I took that picture, I took my trail camera out, thinking it would be really cool if I could get a picture of that bobcat on the trail camera. But I don't think lightning is going to strike twice. I put the camera up. I checked it. The next day, I didn't have anything. The next day I went in, I put the, I had this laptop with me, my car, I put the chip in it, and that was what greeted me when the chip opened up. And this cat was feeding on a deer carcass that the coyotes had killed. And there's another one carrying a squirrel across the ice. You can see the bobcats at Corbin don't go hungry. And this was going away from me. My hands, I was eating a candy bar. And I dropped everything and took a picture of this cat. And it stopped in time enough for me to take this picture. Amazing. presentation Dave. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to invite people to uh, linger for a few minutes and if you'd like to talk to Dale and he also has his new book which is available for signing and um, it's beautiful as we've seen and you saw that he has tons of photographs on, on his website which is North Quaven Photography. Photography. So here's Dale's book Secret Lives of the Quaven Watershed and it is available this evening. It may, may be a nice gift for the holidays. Mm -hmm. And as you saw, the photographs are wonderful. And it is Dale's first book. So we're really pleased to be um, part of his launching of his book in uh, Massachusetts. So thank you very much for coming this evening. I'd like to welcome you to uh, consider other programs that we will be offering through the month of October, um, especially uh, next week on October 4th, which is Thursday, we have Barbara Morali, who is, uh, will be with us from uh, the College of the Holy Cross, and she's here uh, to talk about her trip to Uganda. And so you've been interested in wildlife in Western Massachusetts, and um, now you have the opportunity to think about uh, wildlife in East Africa. So you're welcome to come next week, 6.30. And through the month, we will have some more offerings as part of the last Green Valley Walktober as well. Um, the cal calendar is available online. And just to let you know that um, we have um, Italian heritage. And we have Dr. Teresa Fava uh, Thomas coming from uh, Fitchburg State at the end of the month. And we have Mark Wagner coming from Worcester State. And he's going to be talking about uh, Henry James Thoreau, and uh, it's the 200th birthday, and it will be our last in a series of three programs on Thoreau. 
thank you very much again for coming and please do feel free to come and talk today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Those programs in the Walktober calendar that you just said, are they somewhere else? Are they in? The There's a website as well. But they, are they in the Walktober calendar? The uh, ones that you just mentioned? Uh, yes, some of them, and our own calendar as well, Jacob Edwards Live. Uh, okay. Okay. And I do have, um, one of the requirements for the Walktober is that we um, ask people to write in their name and where, what town they're from, just so that they, uh, people in Danielson get an idea that we did attract people from all corners of the uh, Quintamog should talk it. So if I can pass this round as well, if you don't mind. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.